Welcome to Ask a Doctor, what your doctor wants you to know with Dr. Virgie. Over the next hour, you'll learn valuable medical tips from health policy to personal finance and medical debt management. Now listen close and welcome your host, Dr. Virgie Bright Ellington. To find out what your eye doctor wants you to know, I reached out to Dr. Daniel LaRoche. Dr. LaRoche is the Director of Glaucoma Services and President of Advanced Eye Care of New York and Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology at Mount Sinai School of Medicine and New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. Dr. LaRoche has performed thousands of glaucoma surgeries and helped many young surgeons become experts in the latest in medical laser and surgical treatment of glaucoma. He's also been voted one of the top doctors in New York and the United States several years in a row. Dr. LaRoche is an undergraduate alumni of New York University, earned his medical doctorate with honors in research from Cornell University Medical College, and completed his residency at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and his glaucoma fellowship at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. Dr. LaRoche has volunteered on several medical missions to Haiti and throughout the Caribbean. As a result of his dedication to community service, Dr. LaRoche has received numerous awards, including from the City Council of New York for outstanding contributions to New York City, and from the United Black Men of Queens, New York for outstanding leadership. Dr. LaRoche is also the author of How to Be a Successful Black Man, which was just published last year. Wow, Dr. LaRoche, we've known each other a really long time. I'm not going to say how many decades, but I think it's going back to med school, so I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to count the years. But, you know, and I still can't keep up with all of your hard work and contributions to medicine and community service. Thanks for taking time out of your super busy schedule to talk with me today. Thanks for having me, uh, Virgie. It's a pleasure to see you and a pleasure to be here. Congratulations on your new radio show over here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I have to ask, what do you think came first for you? Your dedication to help those who were less fortunate in your community and, you know, throughout the country, you know, throughout the nation and internationally, or your calling to help folks as a physician? What do you think came first? That's a big question there. Um, when I was young, uh, I, my dad was a physician, so I was always exposed to medicine. He was an anesthesiologist, and my mom was a nurse. So I grew up in a medical household, so I'd always been exposed to that. And in school, I found that I had an affinity for the science and math. I did well in sciences and math, as opposed to social studies and English. And so uh, with that and that early exposure to medicine, uh, that piqued my interest. And so I was more interested in the sciences, medicine, and pursuing that as a profession uh, in terms of that. Then as I was doing medicine, and uh, I learned about the various disparities that took place in medicine, and, uh, mm. both within the United States, and you were able to see that firsthand when you're working in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're going for, I, I went through different facilities. I went to some of the top universities. I worked in very wealthy areas. Mm -hmm. And I went to some of the top universities where we rotated in very poor areas. And you can see the big disparities that took place. And so then um, that, that intrigued me, and I wanted to address those health disparities. Say, you know, we have to have a better system, create better opportunities so people can get excellent access to care. Mm -hmm. And so then I gravitated towards um, uh, developing newer surgical techniques that are more affordable, more efficacious, mm -hmm. and, uh, and working in the community. I established my offices, private practices right in Harlem, in Southeast Queens as well, so people have, you know, uh, we're on Jamaica Avenue. Mm -hmm. So I said, I provide Fifth Avenue. I brought Fifth Avenue to Jamaica Avenue. There you go. And so uh, so the patients get first-class Ivy League board-certified care right in their communities. And we need a lot more of that. Uh, people can still do well and survive and have a good practice. And uh, practice will be very busy because uh, throughout the United States, there are many communities that are underserved. And it's very rewarding when you know, the, you have a good relationship with the community. The community appreciates you being there. They appreciate your expertise. Uh, and you have a good relationship with the people there. And uh, and so you can make a big difference, in both in the health of the community, health outcomes, and uh, and deliver jobs to the community. I employ people 
uh, locally from the community. And we own the real estate in the community. And we own mm. the in the community. So it's another way to rebuild uh, underserved areas as well. You know, I can vouch for that. You definitely bring Fifth Avenue care to Harlem, you know, to the inner city. Uh, I seen you at both of your practices in Harlem and in Queens. I traveled to Harlem and Southeast Queens when I was living in Manhattan, I was living on Fifth Avenue. And I made sure, you know, you were my eye doc, you were my ophthalmologist and I can vouch, you know, top care. And the only reason why I don't travel in, I you know moved out of the city. The only reason why I don't travel in to see you now, though that was my original plan is just, you know, time gets away from you. You think, okay, all right, it'll take me four hours to get there and back. And that's half the day. But I seriously thought about it, Dr. LaRoche, you know that you're my doc. So um, I still consider you my doc, even though it's, it's been some time since I left Manhattan. <laughs> but yeah, um, seriously, uh, first rate ophthalmology. And uh, that's why I wanted to talk to you and ask you what you think, in your opinion, what does your eye doctor want you to know? Well, um, as we get older in life, particularly around age 40, people start to need reading glasses. You'll notice that when you're trying to read, you'll, you'll be stretching your arm further and further away. And do that Fred Sanford then, kind of move with the arms, right? And that's yeah. because the lens, <laughs> the lens that's in the eye doesn't focus as well as it used to. It gets a little harder and doesn't focus as well. And then you start to need reading glasses. That's one of the first things that's age-related, uh, needing reading glasses to help read. Also, in this pandemic, a lot of people are doing Zoom. You want to make sure you get your eyes checked to make sure you're seeing the computer well, at computer distance and for reading as well, and so you're not straining your eyes too much. Uh, there's a 20-20-20 rule where when you're looking at the computer screen, every uh, 20 minutes, you want to look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Mm. So that helps your eyes to relax a little bit, not just get focused and uh, strained from looking at the computer for several hours in a row. You want to take a break from looking at the computer. So that's something that's a nice little pro for this pandemic. But then the other thing is with age, the lens in the eye gets a little bit larger in some people. And when it gets larger in some people, it can cause the eye pressure to go up. Mm. If you touch your eye, Eye pressure is normally about 15. But when the eye pressure goes up to about 18 or higher, that can start to lead to damage to the nerve in the back of the eye. The optic nerve is the nerve that connects the eye to the brain called cupping. Okay. And that can cause damage and loss of peripheral vision slowly but surely. And you don't notice it. Hmm. And that's what glaucoma is. Okay. Okay, glaucoma is when you have this loss of peripheral vision due to damage of the optic nerve usually associated with elevated eye pressure. It starts to begin around people around 40, 50 years of age. And Are there certain see, ethnic groups that have a uh, uh, higher propensity to have, to develop high eye pressures, to develop glaucoma than others? Yes. Um, the elderly, the older you are, the, the line goes up with age. The older okay. you are. That's one. Two, um, African-Americans, Asians. Latinos, people with brown irises. Okay. Than light irises. Okay. And the reason for that is because when the get, lens gets larger, it rubs up against the iris and releases pigment that can block the drain. Wow. And when the lens gets okay. larger, it can narrow mm -hmm. the drain. And those are different. The requirement uh, for a publicly traded company was to be a good corporate citizen. So to make sure that they provided tax base, you know, enough of a tax base to the community for great schools and infrastructure and roads and things like that. As of 1972-ish, again, I believe, uh, the federal law changed such that the number one uh, uh, role of a publicly traded company is to return profits to their shareholders. So you have insurance companies, which are the foundation of the healthcare, United States healthcare system. And every year they have to return profits to their shareholders, right? Not just every year, it's like you mentioned, short-term quarterly. And they have to year after year, quarter after quarter, they have to show an increase in profits and deliver that to shareholders. Well, 
to your point, long-term outcomes are not going to be in, in their interest. So yes, there is nothing that is going to prevent them, prevent them, meaning the insur- them, the insurance companies, from returning a profit to their shareholders. And not only not preventing them, by law they have to. It's illegal for them not to. So it's not going to get better until we educate the American public, the American patient, and the providers who are stuck trying to figure out how to uh, protect themselves or making sure that the um, insurance companies take profits from their services, from from their work, from your work. So it's an educational um, issue in terms of, you know, health disparities and eye care and health disparities in the United States, period. Uh, is, is a result of a, a, a publicly traded, meaning for-profit, by law, uh, health care system. And, you know, you, you explained that very well. Thank you for that. And I want to give you an example of how that affects us as doctors. Um, there's a health insurance company. I won't say any names for right now. Please don't say names. I won't say names <laughs> but, it, but it applies to them all. <laughs> They have start cutting back paying me for care I've provided. I provided the care. We sent a claim in. They said, oh, we want to see the copy of the medical record. We send the medical record in. They said, oh, this, this is insufficient, so we're not paying you at all. I've done a surgery. We send a claim in. Oh, the documentation is insufficient. We're not going to pay for the surgery. Or it's not indicated. We're not going to pay for the surgery. I'm like, well, well, what was not indicated? What was wrong? They won't say anything and they won't pay for it. So I had to immediately stop taking this insurance. Yes. I can't continue yeah. to provide care and not get paid. That's right. Now I called one of my colleagues up who's a specialist in children. And I asked her, I said, have you been having this problem with this insurance company? And she said, yes. I stopped taking it 10 years ago. Wow. And I said, let me ask you a question. If you're not taking this insurance, because it's a pretty big insurance in the New York area, well, where are your patients going? Because you're the only specialist in this Brooklyn area that can take care of these kids. You're the specialist. Where are the kids going? And you know what she said? The kids are not getting care. Yes. There you go. And that's what I'm afraid is actually going to happen with some of my patients. Because now that I'm not taking that insurance, They'll have no place else to go in the community because I'm like the only one that's there. Exactly. So I was very upset about this because I felt the insurance company was morally wrong and this may be criminally wrong. And I've actually sent a letter to the attorney general about this, describing my experience Mm -hmm. and ask her to investigate. Now, whether that's going to come, and I did that today as a matter of fact. Mm, Excellent. And and because you know what? It's criminal. What some of these insurance companies are doing is really immoral and criminal because they don't have the patient's interest at heart, at the best interest at heart. So like that's, an said, that's an important point. That's an important decision. Say that again, Dr. LaRoche. Yeah, they don't have the what's best for the patient at heart. All right, they've got to return short-term profits. That's their number one by law. The that's they that's have governing to. their decisions, the profits. So, right now, they're attacking the doctors right now because – I'm not alone. I had four of the doctors call me about this same insurance. Yes. Four, four other spe- eye specialists call me, say, hey, look, this is what they're doing to me. This is what they're doing to me. What are you doing about it? And, and they're contacting a lawyer to deal with this. And that's what some of us doctors have to deal with on the back end that the patients don't see. Right. And it, it, it's very unfortunate. And that's why we need a better healthcare system that really focuses on the, the, the dollars that are being spent is focused on the needs of the patients and not shareholders. So this is the thing. Um, The insurance companies know that, yes, it's immoral, it's unethical, but it's not illegal. What is illegal is for them not to return share uh, profits to their shareholders. That's the problem. It's a structural problem that as long as our health insurance system, I'm sorry, our health care system in this country is run by publicly traded health insurance companies, this is what we have. 
So we have to educate the providers, the physicians and surgeons, and the patients of what's going on, why the patients are essentially, you know, played, they're in the middle of, you know, both ends playing against the middle, right? Um, and the docs, the providers are busy trying to figure out how to protect themselves from the profits that the insurance companies are taking out of their work. Well, what you just described is contributing to healthcare disparities. That's it. Okay. You That's just described it. So, you described so, it, Dr. Roche. Yeah, so. Well, you know, when you can't take the insurance because you can't pay for your staff, you can't pay for your OR time, your facility fees, uh, um, your your basically your OR time, that's what contributes to the direct contribution to the health disparities in this country. Yeah, so that's that's a, a big one right there. And that's why we need health care reform. And in my opinion, I think we need more like a universal health care system or one payer system. Uh, in that respect, so it's more even even out. So it's fair across the board for everybody uh, in that respect. And uh, because it's unequal right now between the have and have nots. So Giving colleagues. folks who want it and need it, the, need it the option of having at least some basic health care, access to some basic health care. And I thought that this would be, I have to be honest, Dr. Roche, I thought this would be, how should I say, a, a no-brainer after COVID with the pandemic has demonstrated that none of us want to be on the same roads, walking in the same streets, in the same grocery stores with people that don't have access to basic health uh, health care. And so I just thought that this would be that the normal, the, I'm sorry, a natural outgrowth of what was demonstrated in the pandemic. If you give folks care, just access to basic care, that is best for all of us. It's a public health issue. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats. What's good for other folks is good for me and mine. And I, I'm surprised that it, it just... I feel like it's just um, gotten swept under the rug, for lack of a better description. What are your I thoughts? Think, what do you see? I, no, I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you. Um, I, I think that the way the system is set up and with these uh, plans that we have, all these different insurances, and for-profit insurances, they say they're nonprofit. The insurance companies will say they are a nonprofit organization. But if you look at their executives, their executives are making $5 million. Second executive, $3 million. You know, third executive, 2.5. All the top executives are making millions of dollars. Absolutely. Nonprofit providers, nonprofit medical systems, and nonprofit health insurance companies, nonprofit payers, doesn't mean no revenue. They want to maximize their revenue. Mm-hmm. And it just means that they have more revenue to be able to buy fancier buildings and, um, you know, uh, hire the rock stars of the industry. So, like you said, $5 million salaries for their C-suite folks. So, so patients, I mean, basically, you want to try, what I tell patients is, look, try through your employer to get a good insurance, okay, that's going to be good uh, and give you access to a broad spectrum of doctors and that they're responsible, that they will pay for your bills when you're in time of need, okay? Because most people are pretty healthy. But when you are in time of need for something to be done, you'd like to make sure that they can pay for you to get your services that you need because health, there is a fee for health care. You know, just pay a reasonable amount. I mean, yeah. the, like the Medicare standard. Most doctors take Medicare, you know, the Medicare standard fee or whatever that rate is in that respect. But to not pay a doctor... Or to, or, or to pay a doctor $25 for a visit uh, that should significantly underpay, and there's many insurances that have that reputation, you want to stay away from that type of insurance. So, so there are many of us that don't have an option, Dr. LaRoche. Um, you know, we're with, you know, the job that we have is the job that we have, and they don't offer this. And so what is needed in the short term until this system, the system is not going to change anytime soon. This is a system that we have. So in the meantime, we educate our patients, we educate the American public uh, and providers uh, to do exactly what you're doing, what you did today. Get in touch with your state Department of Insurance and or your state Department of Health, who are often responsible for the uh, reimbursement and billing practices and payment practices of not just 
hospitals in that state uh, and medical systems, but also the insurance uh, companies that are uh, practicing uh, in that in your state. So that is actually the number one thing that we can all do, providers and patients can do, to protect themselves and educate themselves pending until the system changes, which isn't going to be anytime soon. Let's protect ourselves while we're in this system. Also, there are some things that people can do. One, try to get some good employee insurance to your job. If you can't get uh, employee insurance to your job very well, uh, and you can't get a good insurance policy on your own financially, right? then you know you could try to apply for Medicaid. When you apply for Medicaid, there are certain Medicaid plans. Some are better than others, mm -hmm. okay? Some of the better ones, I will share the names of the better ones. Uh, Elder Plan is currently good. Okay. Metro Plus is good. Uh, th those are two of the better Medicaid plans and where they pay comparable rates to Medicare, okay? And you can get a broad spectrum of access to doctors and good specialists. So those are two right there. So uh, a lot of doctors don't take Medicaid alone. Mm -hmm. you take this... Uh, Medicaid plan, um, that will give you greater access to doctors. So that's something you can do. And then also, if you don't have any insurance at all, um, and maybe you you can't, you're not eligible for Medicaid, there are certain programs like the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Uh, they have an Eye Care America program where you contact them, and depending on your location, uh, there are different volunteers. I'm a volunteer, and uh, they can schedule an appointment to see us, and we'll see you free of charge for a first visit, just to make sure everything's okay with your eyes. And if there isn't a problem, we'll let you know, but then you, at least you'll be aware and you can make provisions in your lifestyle to take care of yourself in that respect for future ongoing visits. So these are some things that you can do um, to still access eye care uh, and there are other programs for medical care as well. Thank you so much for this, Dr. LaRoche. This is really, really insightful and um, educational super helpful. I, I have to say that, you know, summarizing it, it's, um, I, I often wonder how to, I often wonder how to tell folks why they need to get an eye exam every year, even if they see well, if they have no problems, why do they need to get an eye exam? Why do they have to see an eye physician, an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, an MD? And you summed it up really well because you can have little things that you aren't noticing that uh, are impinging on your vision because they're not impinging in the middle of your visual field. You know, you look at something and everything seems fine, but you don't realize that there's something that's getting ready to blow up and just um, and, and take your vision, just slowly eat away and take your vision or, or um, uh, significantly um, impact, impair your vision. And the other issue that you really covered really, really well, Dr. Roche, is the issues of health disparity and not just eye care, but in medical care and how patients, how the American patient can protect themselves. So if you don't have access to good insurance, what people call good insurance, meaning access to good physicians, good surgeons, good specialists, if you don't have, if you make too much uh, to uh, qualify for Medicaid, that there may be some um, uh, options in terms of making sure that you have coverage. And again, I always remind folks, and not just patients, but also providers, if you have issues with coverage, if you think something should have been paid, if doctors think that their claim should have been paid and, and was not, if patients think that their uh, care should have been covered and was not, uh, or they get a bill that doesn't seem uh, fair, reach out to your State Department of Health and or your State Department of Insurance. So thank you so much for going over these issues, Dr. LaRoche. Much, much appreciated. Thanks for spending the time. Thank you. Thank Good you stuff. Good stuff.